enough folks. It's uh, good to see you tonight. tonight. Sorry I'm a wee bit late there. I was just gassing uh, before coming in. And uh, all the announcements were made this morning. Uh, we've been invited to uh, a table quiz and dessert evening on Friday the 12th of February. It's in aid of uh, the Sunday School or, or Scripture Union and uh, East Belfast Project. It's in Bloomfield Presbyterian. If you're interested, come and see me after the evening service. Our first hymn sets the tone for the evening as we are reminded again of who Christ is and what he has done. There is a Redeemer. We'll stand as we worship. On Wednesday is our child protection training evening at half past seven. And so if you're working with children or vulnerable adults at all in church here, I uh, would ask you to come along uh, to that meeting, to that training. Or if you're thinking that you might volunteer at some stage, then it'd be useful to come along at half past seven. Our prayer meeting is at seven o'clock. It'll be shorter uh, this week. Our prayer meeting is usually seven o'clock to about quarter to eight, but it'll be shorter. And what we actually plan to do in our prayer meeting is that uh, on the first Wednesday of each month, we're going to dedicate that prayer meeting to work overseas. And so maybe you don't normally come to the prayer meeting, but if you're free for half an hour this Wednesday, it'd be great to see you as we pray uh, for the mission organisations that we're involved with here in Strand, but maybe any mission organisation that you're involved in or you know anything about, you can come along and share that with us and we will pray uh, for that work. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our Redeemer. Thank you that as we read your word in the Old Testament, as they were pointing to the Messiah, there was lots of words, lots of titles that they used of you. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Counselor, Almighty God, the Prince of Peace the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, many, many different titles. And all of those titles tell us something of your character and of your work. But the best title of all is that you're our Redeemer. And as we read the scriptures, we thank you that there's a great wee book that, that helps us to understand what that word means. That's not a word that we use much in our language today in the 21st century. But as we read the book of Ruth, it reminds us, it gives us an illustration of what a redeemer does. As Ruth had nothing, 
She gathered the, the odd bits of, of, of uh, straw and wheat from the, the edges of the, of the fields. And that's all she had. She would have enough for Naomi and herself to eat. And that was all. There was no provision for the future. Uh, there was no extra that they could sell. And so they lived really hand to mouth. And the future was very, very uncertain. But as we read the account of what took place, we read about the man Boaz. Boaz, who was a distant relative of Ruth through marriage. And it tells us that he was a kinsman redeemer. And really as the story unfolds, it tells us of how he was able to redeem the land that was lost to Naomi and her family. And he was able to re-establish relationships that Naomi had and Ruth was able to have in that community. And he brought into their lives security, brought into their lives meaning again. For they were classed as outsiders. They were classed as those who had no rights whatsoever. But because Boaz was willing to redeem the land and to redeem their lives, it brought them back into society as full free members. And that's a wee picture of what you do for us. We who are lost in our sins, who have lost everything and we were children of wrath, slaves to ourselves and slaves to sin and slaves to Satan. We were under your condemnation. The future was bleak for us. There was no sense of hope that we could get ourselves out of the situation. Of course, Lord, we we try to hide that sense of hopelessness as we, we try to gather in wealth or, or health or happiness in this world, trying to distract ourselves with other things around about us. But spiritually speaking, our situation was hopeless and there was no way forward except through Jesus, our Redeemer, who came to this earth as the sinless Son of God, and died on the cross to redeem us from our sin. He took the penalty as Boaz took the debt and paid the debt on behalf of Ruth and Naomi. Jesus paid the debt. The debt owed by sin. And he has redeemed us. And now we have a future and now we have a glorious present and we know that we are now children of God. No longer children of wrath. We are no longer slaves to our past, slaves to ourselves, our, our sinful selves that has a bias towards evil and sin. We're no longer slaves to Satan. He has no power over us because of the redeeming work of Jesus. And we're alive, alive forevermore. And so we thank you at the very beginning of our service. We sing, there is a redeemer. And that redeemer is one who can redeem because it's Jesus, God's own son. And that wants to be our theme for the rest of the service tonight as we focus again on, on what you tell us and what it means for us to have hope what it means for us to be blessed and what it means to, for us to live as children of God. We are different from the way we were before. No longer is Satan our father. No longer are we controlled by sinful desires. But we're now children of God that are blessed with hope in our hearts. Speak to us tonight, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. With that redemption comes peace as we sing when peace like a river. 
Let's stand as we worship. I thought we'd start something new, if that's okay. We're going to continue to look at one book per night, and we'll do that once a fortnight. I thought the other fortnight, what we'll look at is the Sermon on the Mount, and that'll take us a wee while to do that, because chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel. There's three main sermons of Jesus. There's lots of teaching uh, in the Gospels, but there's three bulk teachings of, of one sermon at a time. You've got the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is in Matthew, and then you have what we call the Sermon on the Plain, which is in Luke. It is, it's similar, but not quite the same as the Sermon on the Mount. And then there's a number of passages, chapters in, in John's Gospel, where Jesus is teaching the disciples about lots of different things. And, and so not technically a sermon, but a, but a large teaching block. And so we thought tonight we'll look uh, over the next few weeks and maybe months at, at the Sermon on the Mount, 
to see what Jesus is saying. And if you read chapters 5, 6, and 7, it reads in 10 minutes. And, and you can be sure that when Jesus brought these people together, that he didn't speak for 10 minutes. And so what we have here is a summary of what took place and a very important teaching to what Jesus wants us to, to hear about who God is, but particularly Sermon on the Mount is about how we live our lives as Christians, how God expects us to live and how we pray and, and our attitude towards God and our attitude towards others and our attitude uh, to ourselves. And that's really what the Sermon on the Mount uh, is all about. So we're going to read the first 12 verses. This is only the introduction tonight. Uh, we'll look at the first couple of verses, but we'll read the first 12 verses uh, to begin with. It's Matthew chapter 5. This is God's word. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. This is what he said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the poor, pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Let's all pray together. Again, Lord, we come before you and we thank you that this is the first day of a new week. There's lots of things that will be happening here in this building. There'll be lots of things happening in this community. And we want to be praying that you will be exalted in all that goes on. Lord, we also want to pray too. We want to pray specifically for those who will use this building. We want to pray, Lord, that they will hear something of you. And Lord, there, there, there's one thing about being light and salt, and we'll be reading about that very, very soon in this sermon. And sometimes, Lord, we misunderstand what it means. We sometimes understand it, that all we need to do is be faithful, and of course that is true. But you actually call us to plan and to work out how best, to bless and share your good news with others. It's not good enough that we are a presence here in Sydney. It's not good enough that we do lots of good things so that people might see your goodness. We need to have plans of how best we can share your good news with our lips. We must be able to speak of your goodness, of your goodness in us, and of your goodness towards those in which we have contact with. Help us to be expecting to see people come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. For Lord, you're promising that you will draw men and women and boys and girls to your kingdom. And people coming to you will never be disappointed. So help us in all that we do this week that we will think of ways in which we might use our voices to speak of you in such a way that people will know without a shadow of a doubt of who you are and what you've done for us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we, we look at the introduction to uh, the Sermon on the Mount and maybe the, the Beatitudes tonight, we'll sing uh, meekness and majesty. Let's stand as we worship.
The way that Jesus preaches is actually very, very similar to the way that God preached in the Old Testament. The way that God preached in the Old Testament, we read about it in Exodus, is he states his whole sermon in one sentence or in one paragraph or one list of statement. And then he spends the next lot of books, actually. So you've got Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, explaining of what he first said. And so what you've got is what we call the, the Ten Commandments. In Hebrew, it's actually called the Decalogue, which is the Ten Words. Well, that, that's in Greek, sorry, but it's the Hebrew is, is, is the Ten Words, and, and that's what the same is in, in Greek. It means Ten Words. In other words, God states what he expects from his people, the people of Israel, the people that he has come into partnership with, he has made a covenant with, and he states it. And then he goes on and spends lots of months and years explaining how they should live that out. So he doesn't say, okay, that's your list, go for it. Let me see how you get on with it and hope for the best. No, he explains how that actually works out in everyday life. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does exactly the same. He, he makes a statement and then he spends the rest of the sermon explaining how that works out in your life. And the statement that he makes is, is the beat, what we call today is the Beatitudes, the Blessings. There's a bit of discussion whether there's eight or there's seven. More likely there, there's seven. It sounds as if there are eight because there's, there's an, a, a one at the end. But the one at the end is actually repeating the one before that. And so probably there's seven. Uh, the first four Beatitudes uh, is dealing with our relationship with God. And the last three Beatitudes are, are dealing with our relationship with others. Similar to the Ten Commandments, the first four relating to our relationship with God and the last six relating with one another. So Jesus, uh, uh, who is God's son, who is the same person in the Trinity, preaches exactly the way that the Father did in the Old Testament. Makes a statement or a number of statements and then goes on to explain it. And really what the statement is saying, what is your relationship with God like? Because this is what it should be like. And what is your relationship with others like? Because this is what your relationship is like. And, and that's why later on he says, what are the two main commandments? Well, the first commandment is you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second commandment is you love your neighbor as yourself. Really a summary of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments and a summary of the seven Beatitudes. In other words, get your relationship with God right and get your relationship with one another right. And, and as I say, that's what we'll be looking at. We'll look at the seven over the next 14 weeks because we'll be looking at it once a fortnight. And then we'll look at the rest of, of the Sermon on the Mount as how it illustrates how that actually looks, how it looks like in, in real life. And so really at the very beginning, as he does with the Ten Commandments, he said, you know... For you to really be satisfied in your life, for you to be truly happy, for you to be blessed, this is what's required of you. And he states, it's interesting that in the Ten Commandments, Moses goes up the mountain, whereas in, in, the, in the Seven Beatitudes, they all go up the mountain. So it tells us that in the mountain, you've got Jesus, you've got his disciples, you've got the crowd, and we've got the scribes and Pharisees. In other words, Jesus is, is talking to everyone uh, where it's about knowing and recognizing that not everybody will accept this. Knowing that there'll be those who will reject it outright. And that unfortunately happened to be the scribes and the Pharisees. There'll be others who would be quite indifferent about it. You know, they'll hear it, they'll think about it, but won't much, don't know what to do about it. And, and that's the crowds are a bit like that. You know, for some they followed, some they didn't. In the early ministry of Jesus, many people followed him. Near the end of his ministry, many of them fell away. And then you had the inner core, the, the disciples, who he spends many, many hours with. He spends three and a half years with them, uh, trying to explain over and over, and really, if you like, keep emphasizing uh, these seven Beatitudes, that the relationship with God is right and the relationship with others are right. And that's why we're going to spend a week on each one. Uh, to, to fully understand what it's about. But tonight we'll, we'll look at, at what they are for us. And, and, and uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, preaching on, on this passage, says we need to be careful, we need to be sure that we understand, first of all, that the Beatitudes are for every Christian. 
It's not just for the super duper Christians. It's not just for those who are a bit different from others or those who are, are special in some ways. But the Beatitudes are for every Christian. So the Beatitudes refer to me and refer to you and to every Christian. The second thing he talks about when he's saying about the Beatitudes is every Beatitude refers to every Christian. In other words, we, we can't cherry pick and say, well, I quite like that one. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That's quite a nice one. Blessed are the meek, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Blessed are you when they persecute you, I'll, I'll give that one a miss. It's not that you can go into a fruit shop and you, and you can choose. I was in a fruit shop the other day there. I'm juicing at the minute. I'm hoping that it's going to help uh, lose weight. And so I went into the shop the other day around the corner in the Belmont Road and uh, I needed to get some um, grapes. So I said to the guy, are those grapes sweet? It's as though they're very sweet. And as soon as I said it, I thought, isn't that a daft question? So I said to him, you know, that was a really daft question I said to you. Because I'm asking you, are those grapes sweet? And you were never going to say to me, no, they're sour. You were always going to say yes. I said, isn't that a daft question? In other words, I could have gone in there and if he said, no, they're very sour, actually, I would have left it and bought them somewhere else. And sometimes the Beatitudes were like that. We only want the sweet ones. The ones that are a wee bit sour or the ones we don't like. I love bananas and I love grapes. Uh, I don't really like lemons. Uh, oranges I can take or leave. And so therefore, I'm picky with my fruit. Well, you cannot be picky with the Beatitudes. Every Beatitude is for every Christian. So this is not a list. It's a bit like the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is not a multiple choice. Each of the commandments is for you and me. And the third thing Martin Lloyd-Jones talking about this passage says, none of them come naturally. So we can't read these and think, well, actually, see that one there? I'm naturally good at this. And that other one there, I'm not. Do you know sometimes we're, we're naturally good at things and naturally not good at other things? We have bowls here on, on Monday. And, and we, Bert, has been coming to bowls for many, many years. And Bert is not naturally good at bowls. And, uh, but you think that after playing for many years, he would get good at it. And uh, you have to see him to see whether he's getting good at it or not. But sometimes we're both unnatural. If you notice that folk who are really good at football tend to be good at most sports. Most footballers can play a bit of golf too. And those who play a bit of golf can play a bit of tennis or badminton. So those who are good at sport can tend to turn their hand to most things. Those who are good at playing a musical instrument tend to play a number of musical instruments. If you can play one, you can play a number. I think Roy Castles, I think he uh, was in the Guinness Book of Records for playing, I'm not sure how many, but so many musical instruments. Uh, he was, not that he could just have a go at it, he was proficient at many, many different musical instruments because he had a natural ability to music. And there's other people who have got natural ability uh, to sports. And there's other folk, and I won't mention Bert again, but there's other folk who have no natural ability towards sport or music or, or, or things like that. But thankfully you and I are good friends. But here it tells us that none of us in this room have a natural ability towards the Beatitudes. None of us find any of these easy. And so therefore that's why each of them, we need the Holy Spirit within our lives. And so these Beatitudes then, they're for all of us. All of them are for all of us. And none of us will have a natural ability to any one of the seven. And as we look at it, the first word that we notice is blessed. Blessed are whatever it is. It's marakos in, in, in Greek. And that's a very difficult word uh, to translate. We, we, we don't really have it. The, the Good News Bible used to say happy. Happy is the man or happy is the person who. And, and happiness really isn't really the right word to use. And yet happiness is the key word for society today, isn't it? Uh, in, 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 the, um, in America, everybody is pursuing happiness. And if you pursue happiness, you've attained it if you have wealth and health. Those are the two big magical words in America. 
wealth and health. If you have those two things, you're happy. If you've got wealth, you can afford to live in a nice neighborhood. And you've got health, you can enjoy your wealth to live in a nice neighborhood. And those who don't have wealth very often don't have good health because they can't pay for it. And they live in some very, very difficult neighborhoods. And to Britain, it's a lesser extent, but we're becoming more and more like that. In other words, the other day there, if you remember, there was a news article to say that they had found someone who had found their ticket, their lottery ticket, and they won £33 million. £33 million. And I would imagine that most people were thinking, oh, if only I could win that. In fact, I don't even need to win that if I won half a million, because I'm not a greedy person. Or if I won a million, I'm not a greedy person. I would be able to pay the house off, I'd be able to help my family, uh, and I'd be able to sit and enjoy my life. That's why most people, that's why I'm sure everybody does the lottery. They just want a wee win of half a million or a million. But they would take the 33 million uh, if it came their way. But it's the idea that happiness is just outside of themselves. And if only they had a little more money, or if only they, they were, had a little better health, then they could have happiness. And people are seeking happiness in money and in, in health. And it's always just short. And the Guardian newspaper a number of years ago did a survey of over 5,000 people and asked them, what do you regard as happiness? And after the survey, the Guardian said they had no idea what happiness was. Lots of people had lots of ideas of what happiness is really about. But of all the answers they gave, the impression was happiness comes from the outside. So people would say things, if I had a better job, or if I've got a better wife, or if I've got a better husband, or if, if uh, we lived in a better neighbourhood, or if we had a nicer holiday. or It was always related to something outside of themselves. What that was was different for lots of different people, but it was always outside of themselves. Here, happiness, blessedness, is to do with what's inside of you. In other words, true blessedness doesn't come from something outside affecting you, but it actually comes from within and your relationship with God. It's having that relationship with God that brings true happiness, that brings blessedness. And actually, a lot of these Beatitudes, as we'll look at over the next few weeks, are really negative. They're blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed when they persecute you. Blessed are the meek. Meekness is not the most exciting thing. When you think of of Russia and the president, you don't think of meekness. When you think of David Cameron, you don't think of meekness. When you think of Obama, you don't think of meekness. When you think of Donald Trump, you don't think of meekness. Today's leadership is about big confidence. It's about arrogance. It's about taking on uh, those who would oppose you. It's showing that you're strong and powerful and decisive. And meekness seems to be the opposite of that. And yet here it says, blessed are the meek, for it's the meek that will inherit the earth. Putin would love to inherit the earth. Obama would love to inherit the earth. But here it says, it's the meek that inherit the earth. And so it's not from what happens outside of you that brings happiness. It's from what is inside of you that brings this happiness. So we'll be looking at what the true meaning of happiness or blessedness. Happiness is weak. Uh, blessedness is, is something that we struggle with. It's a word that we don't really use today. A uh, uh, canon J.J. John or J. John recommends that we, we think of the word more like how fortunate it is. In other words, when, when you heard of the person who won the 33 million, you thought, oh, boy, they're lucky. They're fortunate. Boy, they're, they're well made. Um, and he, and he argues that it's more like the sense of when we see people who are living the Jesus way, then we should be thinking, how fortunate are they that they've got their relationship with God right and they've got their relationship with, with others right. That's really what the word blessedness means. It's how fortunate, it's how truly happy and, and what it means to follow him. And so over these next few weeks, 
Uh, we'll be looking at this passage and these passages, and we'll be looking at the sense of what makes you truly happy, and, and, and it comes from within, and it needs to come from within. And many of us tend to say the right things, but it's really what's in our hearts that count. And so what truly makes you happy? Is it just that little bit more money? That's what really would make you happy. Is it more security? Would it be really good health? And as Christians, very often I think we say yes to that. Whereas actually what really brings us happiness is knowing that we have that relationship with God. For each one of us can, can actually die this night. I was talking to a girl this afternoon. She would actually come out to see me about something. She's from Ballygraney Presbyterian. And we were talking, and in talking, I mentioned that I used to be in Market Hill. It just wasn't terrible, uh, the accident down in, in Market Hill. I don't know if you heard on the news, there was two young men killed. There was three in the car, and, and one was a wee chap called Gas, and the other wee guy was called Hutchison. And she said, believe it or not, I work with his mum. And I said, oh, the wee boy Gas, because I, I, I know the Gas family. She said, no, the wee boy Hutchison. And uh, they went out really excited that morning. They were going to put it down uh, to do a, a contest. And they were excited. And so they left their home in Tully Allen. And they went up the road, away from Portadown, away from Market Hill, to Newton Hamilton, where the third wee fella lived. And they picked him up. And on the way back into Market Hill, that's when they crashed. The wee boy who was driving only passed his test two weeks ago. Terrible accident. Terrible accident. We have no idea what the future holds. And therefore happiness, it doesn't come with more money. Happiness, it doesn't come with having the right farm or the right house or the right holiday or whatever. Happiness is knowing that whatever happens, God is with us. And with God is with us, he's is with us for eternity. And therefore, if any of us leave here tonight and we don't see each other again, true happiness actually comes from the fact that we're children of God. And we might not see each other in this world, but we will always see each other in heaven because that's what true blessedness is all about. Let's pray together. Father God, we come again before you and we thank you, uh, Jesus, that while you were here on earth, you spoke lots of great things. We thank you for the Sermon on the Mount and over these next few months we'll be looking at it in depth, thinking about the things that you say. And really it's just that basic of, of how we should live and how we should think as Christians. And when you think about it, because you d died for us, we are the most blessed people of all because blessedness, happiness comes not from things that happen to us because those are fleeting. People can win the lottery and we read about this time and time again. People win the lottery and after a few years they say winning the lottery was the worst thing that happened to us. It destroyed our life. We allowed the money to be more than important than our family. We allowed the money to be more important than our relationships. And it destroyed us as a family. Our family became greedy and resentful and difficult. So happiness doesn't come from getting more money or having better clothes or better holidays or better homes. Happiness comes with having a relationship with you. And so Paul is able to say, whether I have a lot or whether I have little, whether things are going well or whether I'm being persecuted, I am content in every situation. Lord, that's true happiness. Help each one of us so to hear what you say, obey what you say, that we might be truly happy. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is so... Oh, yeah, we've got the offering, sorry. <laughs> Let's continue to worship God with our offering.
Soldiers of Christ arise. And that's what we'll do now. Let's worship God. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen.